So we're going to switch gears from talking about some um, some more endangered species that may have some connectivity issues and the enigmatic leaf monkey to the more notorious long-tailed macaque found not only here in Singapore but throughout Southeast Asia. So I'm comparing both Singapore Bali within this. And macaques, it's important to know, as you all know, are um, a less subtle uh, part of our biodiversity here in Singapore. They're an important seed disperser, and they're one of the remaining few medium-sized mammals that make up the biota here in Singapore. With that, it's because, in part, macaques are highly, highly adaptable, and they become habituated to human beings very well, which is why they're so widespread throughout Southeast Asia. And with that comes the problems that you can see illustrated here. Um, you have garbage raiding and nuisance issues that uh, create complaints from residents living in and around the nature reserves. So the aims of my study were first to get a characterization of the genetic diversity using this mitochondrial d region, then assess using that data the site connectivity both within Singapore and within Bali. And you can do this on varying time scales. So one aspect of my project is deploying GPS collars that assesses short-term monitoring. The data I present today covers more medium-term monitoring um, using this more highly evolving, fast evolving region of DNA. Then you can switch to longer term monitoring using nuclear sections of the genome that may evolve at a slower rate. Um, and the question is really to contextualize how this applies to management. Um, and as you may or may not know, in the news in the past year, culling is a really hot button issue with regards to macaques. As of July 2013, 330 individuals have been culled. We're at well over 500 at this point since January 2013, which represents anywhere from a third to a fourth of the population of macaques existing in Singapore. So this is really, by and large, the aspect that most shapes the macaque population on Singapore. You have low levels of predation by pythons, by feral dogs, of the very young, the very old, the very sickly. But really, it's humans that are uh, the highest predator for macaques, be it cars, but mainly culling. And so we need to ask ourselves, in what situation will culling be effective? And what situation will it be a long-term solution? And that's a scenario of low connectivity between sites. If you have high connectivity between sites, you would expect an influx or movement of individuals from neighboring regions. And then I'd like to go through other relevant applications for using this data. Um, so like I said, to investigate this, I'm using the hypervariable region, a segment of the mitochondrial DNA. Um, it's a non-coding segment of DNA that quickly evolves and can show us recent trends in population structure. It's important to note that it's maternally inherited. When you think about macaques, the female sex is phylopatric. They remain in their group when the males emigrate. So when you're sampling from a male, you're actually sampling their mother's um, maternal DNA, and so you can detect origins of these emigrant males. Um, when you see structure in the DNA, it's indicative of stable female populations or match lines over time, whereas low structure indicates a disturbance habitat or shifts in these match lines throughout time and space. So to quickly overview Singapore versus Bali, Singapore is obviously much smaller. You have a subsequently smaller population of 1,500 to 2,000 attacks, comprised of 60 to 70 troops, and a very, very high human density of more than 5 million people. Here, the sentiments towards the cats are that feeding is illegal, which is um, a great management effort already, and you don't have the temple provisioning that you see in Bali. Bali, we're dealing with more than 10,000 attacks at over 60 sites, each site having multiple groups, and a much, much lower human population of less than 5 million, given that Bali is eight times the size of Singapore. Now, the key here is that provisioning is a major, major cultural aspect within Bali, you have these major and minor temple sites as well as households that have um, a strong tradition of provisioning the macaques with food. So if you look at the sites sampled in Bali, um, the first thing I'd like you to know is the relative size difference to Singapore. We can fit about eight Singapores in one Bali. And then the next thing that I'd like you to know is how each site has a really heavy association with these temples. And the provisioning then roots those populations that we can see when we look at the structure. So you've already seen in some of these other presentations this graphical representation or a haplotype network. So for Bali, I had about 130 samples looking at approximately 600 base pairs of DLE. In that, I found 21 unique haplotypes or unique genetic states. Each of the black dots is one of those haplotypes. The open dots are um, missing links, essentially, that would get filled in with greater sampling. Each line between them represents one mutational step, where hash marks represent additional mutational steps 
and numbers are indicative of deeper divergence greater than 10 mutational steps. So across Bali, what we can see first is differences in the proportional representation of haplotypes. Some haplotypes are more common than others. The bigger the circle, the more proportionally represented it is. Then we can look at certain groups. Um, you can't see it in H5, but it's actually light gray. Um, so Uluwatu, Mekori, Pulaki, and Bator all have really high structure and site fidelity with those temples. One temple is showing only one um, unique genetic variation. Whereas you get other sites that have temple fidelity, but perhaps two haplotypes represented. Once you add in the full data set, you can see that there's still very high site fidelity and site structuring, but you can look at those emigrant events, those emigration events. So where we're looking at blue up at the top, Pedantagal is one of the more major temples at Ubud. Um, H15 and that blue and H13 are all single individuals. So those are likely emigrant males that came from outside populations into Pedantagal. Um, likewise, between Angseri and Badugal, those are single individual events, and likewise Badugal and Bukitgumang. So this is likely an individual born at Bukitgumang who emigrated into Badugal. So this is all supported statistically by Mantel tests that show a strong trend for isolation by distance, analysis of molecular variation, which indicate that sites are the best explanation for this genetic structure, so each individual temple. And when you apply the analysis and the molecular variance to intuitive regional divides um, based on the geography of Bali, based on volcanoes, mountain ranges, north, south, east, west, central, peripheral, um, you see no regional trend. So it really, really is these temple sites that are causing this structure. And FST values, another statistical measure of divergence between groups, also concur. When we look at Singapore, you can see that Singapore has been very heavily sampled. In the current analysis are all the green and the yellow dots with forthcoming analysis on the orange. If I'm very lucky, I'll get some from the sites in red. Um, but looking at Singapore, we have a slightly larger sample set of 163 individuals looking at the identical genetic region. Again, each black dot is a unique genetic variant, and you can see the proportional representation based on the size of the circles. So there's two haplogroups that we're seeing. Up here is the first haplogroup, and this characterizes by and large most of the island, with haplotype 5 being the most common, and many closely, closely related haplotypes coming off of it. And then the second haplogroup down here. Um, we have a similar situation where there's a few populations that have really high site fidelity, and these are structured around these islands, Sentosa and Sisters Island. So geographically, that makes sense that they're effectively acting like the temples in Bali do. When you add in the second level of variation, though, um, those groups that have two, perhaps three haplotypes represented, you can already see a very different picture from Bali. You can already see that these, these pies are made up of a much more diverse grouping or assemblage of communities. When you add in Lower Pierce, Upper Pierce, Bright Orange Road, and McRitchie, the major catchment areas where macaques live, um, you see rampant mixing and movement or high site connectivity throughout Singapore as a whole. Um, so then these again are backed up by the statistical tests. There's no trend of isolation by distance, and the amoebas actually highlight um, a pretty interesting story here, with yellow being Bukitima and purple being Bukitbata. And so you actually see that uh, the split between Bukitima and Bukitbata is the most explanatory structural split, or the split between half of groups one and two. Once you start in adding neighboring populations like those of Rifle Range Road or Chestnut Avenue, which you might qualitatively see on a map and think to intuitively add, um, the trend disappears. So it really is Bukitima and Bukitbatak that have some special situation going on. So looking at that, they're not only unique in mitochondrial DILU, there's a previous study done by Salachi um, of the Cytochromoxidase 2 unit, and they also see that trend where Bukitbatak is genetically distinct from central catchment. Um, in preliminary data from my lab on parasite profiles, again, Bukitima and Bukitbatak have a unique parasite assemblage, and we expect very well to see the same in isotopic profiles being generated. And so this is the signature of stability. You can think about how human villages in particular regions have settled over time and stayed in regions for thousands of years, even tens of thousands of years. The same happens for particular primates. You see it in great apes, you see it in different groups of monkeys, where there's certain stable regions and you can see this genetic stability of 
particular either matrilineal or patrilineal groups, depending on which sex is dispersing. And we seem to be getting that at this highly diverged group with Bugatima and Bugapata. Um, and so if you take away the stability over time, you can actually lose some genetic variation. The structure between these haply groups is adding overall genetic variation in the whole picture of Singapore. Um, so what are the management implications? The management implications here are that there's this really strong and clear, distinct signature of movement that you don't see happening in Bali. So in a place like Bali, calling could be effective if you needed to get rid of the macaques at, say, on the Sari area. You could call the macaques there, and it's unlikely that macaques are going to have an impetus to quickly repopulate that area. Whereas Singapore, calling is going to be ineffective because these sites are so, so highly connected. It's a matter of very little time before a neighboring group from one of the Pierces or Upper Selitar infiltrate an empty space that's generated. So what do we want to think about? We want to think about how that money that can be spent on culling could be repurposed to something that's going to be effective in the longer term. So here in Singapore, we already have monkey-proof trash bins, but these need to be more ubiquitous, larger, and in some cases stronger. There's a variety of monkey-proof bins that you see throughout um, the reserves. This is actually a great example that I saw in Baca National Park, where you actually need a very heavy foot pedestal to open it, and it's much larger than your average trash bin, so you don't have the issues of overflow. Um, the other thing is we constantly have new buildings, new condominiums and refurbishments next to the nature reserves. The new buildings need to be held accountable and need to start putting monkey proofing into them because then you get the subsequent complaints of residents. And in some cases, builders just aren't being held accountable to even disclose. I've heard from a number of residents who ask if there's a monkey problem and they're told no, when it's very obvious that they're in a region where there would be a monkey problem. So builders can't, they need to have some level of accountability there. But the more important aspect is looking at the, the prospect of using monkey guards. This has been shown in Gibraltar and Hong Kong, the most directly comparable populations to Singapore, um, to be the most effective uh, tool for combating monkey problems. And these guards can double for finding, um, finding feeders and enforcement of that effective tool. Um, these are regions I've highlighted, and it's actually two troops at each McRitchie, Bukitima, Lower Pierce that are problematic, and one at Bukit Bata, and the recommended number of monkey guards to implement um, such action. And very, very quickly, I'll run through other applications. You can actually plug in DNA from confiscated or poached macaques, see if they originated in Singapore, or if they originated and were brought in elsewhere. We do want to know if wildlife is being trafficked across borders. Um, recently, there was a case of that in Sembolong. Um, you can identify group origins of a nuisance macaque, or rehab macaques, you can identify a site to re-release them. And finally, we can characterize Singapore macaques within the whole of the species. It's a major biomedical model. We want to understand the evolutionary background of these guys. Um, so going forward, the GPS project is coming to an end on my end, and National Parks is ready to deploy their own 10 collars. And there's, uh, the sky is the limit for genetics. We have hundreds of spit samples, hundreds of fecal samples, um, so there's more fine-scale genetics that can be done using RADC and landscape genomic models growing. And I'd like to thank not only the Meyer Lab for hosting me, but my home lab and all the funding bodies. Thank you.